Thanks, Michael, and hello, I'm Alcon. Um, thank you to the organizers for putting this together, and thank you especially to all of the attendees. So like Michael mentioned, um, I work at Colgate Palmolive, um, and today's talk is going to be about reinventing product development in consumer goods with uh, machine learning. So maybe you're wondering, uh, what is consumer goods? So Colgate is a good example of that. Um, Colgate is arguably the largest uh, consumer packaged goods producer around the world. So we make all sorts of brands that you probably use every day. Maybe about 50% of you in the audience listening today use Colgate toothpaste, but we're also responsible for palm olive and soft soap. And if you live in Latin America, Fabuloso. And if you live in France, Supline. Um, and so I, I think maybe a more appropriate technical title for the talk today is uh, a journey from parsimony to prediction and halfway back again. So by way of background, uh, my background is actually in the physical sciences. I have a PhD in chemistry. And, you know, that upbringing really ingrained Occam's razor in my head, this idea that simplicity is the ultimate goal for, for, model, uh, for model building. And the story that I want to tell you today is about a project that um, we had worked on at Colgate, our, our analytics team, and sort of our journey um, along Occam's razor going from a focus on simplicity and explainability to hard prediction and um, working our way backwards again. And so really the core question here, and this is I think a question that everyone contends with who, who works in this field, is where is the balance between explainability, simplicity, parsimony, and prediction power, right? Do you actually care how a model is working? And um, more importantly, when you're framing a business question, um, what does it take to answer that business question? Is it prediction or is it explainability? So I think, you know, you know, recommended reading or anyone who is, you know, working in the explainable AI space, you know, which, which is a big buzzword now, um, you know, uh, I'd say required reading is this article from Leo Bremen, who's a statistician, was a statistician um, at, at UC Berkeley called Statistical Modeling, the Two Cultures. And th this article is about 20 years old now. But for me, I think this really lays out the core theoretical framework, although it's non-technical, it's written in that are very easy to understand terms, but the core framework um, bridging the, the gap between traditional statistics and between um, machine learning uh, people like, like everyone on, on this call. Um, so really recommended reading there. And, and essentially the problem is you have you know, nature transforming some inputs to some output. And in the context that today, I'm going to be talking to you about machine learning and chemistry for product development. So, you know, we really are talking about nature in a literal sense and approaches to modeling that. And there's, there's really three ways you can think about this. There's theory where you have a data model and the coefficients for, you know, so you have an equation and the coefficients for that come from empirical experiments that you run, right? And then you kind of have traditional statistics, regression and so on, where you write down an equation, you put together a data model and you take all of your Y's and you fit your data model, figure out the coefficients and, you know, then you understand how X goes to Y. And then of course, the last is machine learning field where, you know, you're not fitting against the data model, you're fitting to try to find the function. Right. And where on this continuum do, do you need to do you need to sit to answer the question? Uh, so to frame this, you know, the business need for Colgate in the context of this problem is how do we launch more products more quickly? Right. We're in the business of getting products on the shelves that people want to buy that deliver what they're looking for. Um, and that's surprisingly complicated. Right. And it's a convergence of what do people want? and what technology is gonna deliver it for them. And there's all these constraints that we have to worry about. Is it safe? Is it efficacious? Does it work? Can we manufacture it? Does it meet regulatory um, guidelines? Can we commercialize it? Um, is it gonna be uh, cost effective for the company and so on? So the question that, that came to our analytics team internally that you know the modeling request here was, hey, we have to develop products. And so can you build a model that models out the interactions between ingredients to speed up the process of developing new formulas. That process, just as an aside, takes a long time. So we're talking years 
from idea inception to getting a product that meets all of his constraints under the shelf. Um, so this is not a chemistry talk, but I'll talk a little bit about what modeling looks like in the realm of chemistry because it's relevant. So, you know, modeling and chemistry has been around for a long time and there's lots of new work happening using neural networks um, and, and machine learning to model chemical interactions. Um, those are more on the immature side relative to the type of systems that, that we're dealing with in consumer goods, um, you know, large multi-molecule complicated systems. Quantum chemistry, big thing now, but still, still relatively mature. Um, and then in the top weight, right, quadrant here in terms of, you know, mature um, approaches that have high explainability. We have traditional statistics like the design of experiments. And then lastly, thermodynamics and kinetics. This is the stuff that you learn about in, in grade, school, grade school in chemistry. Um, this is kind of the gold standard. You know, this is mid 1800s um, uh, type work. And it gives you a fully deterministic general purpose picture about how all of your inputs, you know, all the ingredients that go into a system interact with each other. So like I said, this is a complicated problem just to give you a scope, uh, a sense of the scope of it. You know, a typical consumer product, if you flip it over and look at the ingredient list, you've got about 30 ingredients in there. If you look at the set of all ingredients used in a product portfolio, like the set of all ingredients that could show up in a toothpaste, let's say, um, that's several thousand, right? So you have a lot of features. Um, the second complexity is chemistry is complicated. So it's not uncommon to need to consider third and fourth order interactions here. You have, you know, one ingredient or molecule interacting with two of another one and interacting with another one. So you get these high order uh, interactions that, that you have to somehow model out. And then the last specific to, you know, um, a fully deterministic approach is, thousands of explicit chemical equations that you have to analytically solve for. And to make all of this work, you need to bring in a lot of intuition from subject matter experts and scientists who, who work in this field. Um, so I'm going to you know, move through sort of how you would do this from a fully deterministic chemistry standpoint. It is hard, but not intractable. So you know, to give you a sense of how we, we tackled this before we moved to the machine learning approach, essentially, you know, a team of people, this is about a year of effort, compiled thousands of manually researched chemical constants. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey has this great software package that they use to model out, you know, like um, radioactive spills, you know, from Fukushima to see what happens in the ocean and what happens in mud and soil samples. To, to be able to analytically solve for all these chemical, um, chemical interactions. And what you end up with is a self-consistent, fully deterministic simulation. I type in the ingredients that are gonna go in and this thing calculates out how all of them interact with each other, right? Beautiful system, um, but doesn't do ultimately what the business you know, wanted from, from, from this model, which is, the business wants to be able to look at an output and essentially say, you know, is yes or no, will this product meet all the all of the constraints? And so it turns out in this case, and I think this is often the, the case um, in, in organizations that, that are after um, some sort of modeling, um, it's simplicity, parsimony, ex, ex, explanation, whatever you want to call it for show, but really the dough is in, is in the prediction, right? Um, so we wanted to reframe this a, a little bit. And so if you reframe this, you know, more how you would frame a machine learning problem, the way you'd set it up is like this. I have a bag of chemicals called a product, right? I add a whole bunch of stuff in that's on the ingredient list. What's the likelihood that it will meet the success criteria to be sold on the market? And so by success criteria, and the main things I'm talking about are shelf stability, right? You have a product that goes on the shelf, that product needs to be stable for the lifetime that it could be on the shelf, usually two to three years. If it has an active ingredient, that active ingredient can't degrade, the flavor can't become rancid, the fragrance can't become rancid, the color needs to stay the same color throughout. So all these stability attributes. Clinical studies, will it be clinically efficacious? Will it do what it's supposed to do? If it says it removes wrinkles, will it actually remove wrinkles? Consumer attributes, if it's supposed to be creamy, is it creamy enough? Um, regulatory, is it sustainable, which, which is a big, um, big metric now, and, and can it be manufactured? So as an interesting uh, note, and Michael mentioned this at the top, so Colgate has thousands of scientists around the world who day in and day out make experimental products, right? 
they mix ingredients together, they make a product and they test it. So if we just look at toothpaste, for example, you know, our, our internal database has about 50,000 toothpaste, uh, different toothpaste that scientists have made about, you know, five to 10% of those actually go on the shelves, but our scientists are constantly experimenting with things, right? So we have this, this massive amount of, of data that kind of defines the space of how ingredients come together and interact to give some emergent property of, of the formula. So what is this data, you know, getting, getting into a little bit more detail, what does it look like, you know, if you're trying to uh, frame this as a machine learning problem? So you have your feature matrix, your features are all of the ingredients that go into the product. You have the concentration of each ingredient that, that goes into it. Um, and there's some issues looking at this if, if you wanted to use machine learning to, to solve this problem. So first, like I said, it's sparse, right? So any particular product may have 20 to 30 ingredients, but the set of all products, right, all the features that you need to consider is thousands. Um, data is expensive. So this isn't the type of thing where we have live streaming data coming in from people clicking around on a website. Every single product that gets generated, you're talking a day's worth of work from a scientist just to make the thing, and then months of work to take the measurements over time, lots of people touching it, right? So generally, we have low data volume. 50,000 sounds like a lot, but relative to the number of features, it's not that big. Um, the outputs are imbalanced. And so, you know, usually we have, you know, scientists who've been working on these products for a long time, they have a good sense of what types of ingredients they can combine to get to a certain outcome. And so, you know, you, you get lots of good outcomes or lots of outcomes if you're talking about, you know, the acidity of a product or how efficacious it is. Lots of selection that goes in there where you end up with extremely imbalanced data. And lastly is, you know, what I would call discontinuities in feature space, which you can kind of see on this previous graph, um, which is we make a lot of products. And this is, you know, kind of a, a product of the people who are who are actually doing the work designing these things in the lab, we make a lot of things that are very similar to things that have already been done because if you're a scientist at the lab, that's the easiest way to, to move forward, right? You, you copy from what you know and, and you make a small change. So there's lots of gaps in our data set. It is not a well-balanced data set if you look at the target and it's not a well-balanced data set uh, if you look at the features. So, so first, a naive approach to doing this, right? You, you just came out of, you know, your data science bootcamp and you, you get this problem. Okay, I'm going to build a model. So what does a naive approach look like? Um, and this is just like boilerplate code. Um, and there's really just two things I wanted to point out here um, that, that are useful if you're just tackling this. The first is if you're using uh, XGBoost or gradient boosting regressor to build models, which I think many of you in this field uh, are because generally gradient boosting works out really well. Um, this is maybe preaching to the choir already, but if you're not using quantile loss to get prediction intervals, um, you really should start incorporating it. This will come up later, but it's a great way if you need to communicate prediction results with um, uh, business people who have to make a decision uh, from it, you can build a gradient boosting model um, with quantile loss um, and get you know 90% or 5% and 90% or 20% and 80% confidence intervals around every single prediction. And that is extremely valuable when people have to look at your model, a lot more valuable than like a global uh, global training metric. You know, what's my overall accuracy if you need to make a decision from it. Um, and then the second has to do with Shapley values, which, you know, a number of presenters this morning have, have talked about, and I'm obviously a huge fan of, um, you know, using Shapley values to get a sense of um, explanations from, from the features. This is just, you know, basic code snippet, but there's a lot more that, that you can and should be doing with the Shapley values. So a brief digression about SHAP, I thought this might be um, useful for some of the people in the audience who are maybe just getting started with it, or even if you use SHAP every day. Um, so the plotting syntax in, in the um, SHAP package from uh, S. Lundenberg changed in, in, in 2020, uh, version uh, 0.36. And so a lot of older articles that you might find about how to use um, the chat package um, use outdated syntax. And, and if you look at the issues on, on the GitHub here, you see lots, lots of upset people. Um, so, so just note of that. Second is um, Shap's inbuilt plots are really great for EDA. You know, if you're just a data scientist and you want to get some explanations 
Um, but you'll notice that they lack a lot of customization options. And ultimately, if you're building an end user application, either an application to be used internally or an application that's going to be uh, outside client facing, um, not great for embedding into those applications. So internally, we like to use SHAP for the analysis and Plotly for the visualization. Uh, just to give you a sense of, of what that looks like, and there are some articles on the Medium that kind of talk through this a little bit, but you can go in and uh, you know build a model, get the SHAP explanations, and actually pull those explanations out into a data frame. You pull the base value out of the Shapley model, which is you know the featureless prediction, essentially the, the mean value. And then from there, you have a data frame with all of your SHAP values for every single row, so for every single example that you've given it. And you can do pretty much everything that the SHAP package does from a visualization standpoint, but you know, choose your own framework for, for plotting. Like I said, we use Plotly, but you can use main, you can come up with main effects plots or interaction um, interaction effects or, or uh, B swarm plots and, and so on. Um, so if you are using the out of the box um, uh, graphical uh, capabilities of SHAP, uh, I do recommend just looking in and seeing how to pull those out. Uh, there's a lot more that, that you can do there. Okay, so Shapley values have the interesting um, property that they will keep you honest if you are building a model. So, you know, just taking this naive model that, that I told you about, say we want to predict something like ingredient degradation, active ingredient degradation in, in a product, right? You can end up with a scenario where your model looks great, right? You get good accuracy metrics and you make a plot and okay, everything looks like it falls on a straight line. Um, but then you look at the feature impacts from, from your Shapley analysis and you realize, wow, this, this model actually looks, looks terrible. Um, so in our case, you know, trying to model out how ingredients interact to give some emergent properties of, of a formula um, or what the stability will be and so on. You know, what we found, and I think this is a, a lot more common in other domains too, is that our historical data is littered with what I'd call idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic leaky features. So what I mean by this is, you know, the, the value of a certain feature, you know, whether or not they add in one ingredient or another ingredient or the concentration of the ingredient depends a lot on the, own sci on the scientist's own belief about the outcome of that experiment, right? So all of these people have gone to school, they studied chemistry, and they say, hey, you know, if I'm going to put this active ingredient in, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be stable. So let me add in a stabilizer and I'll change the amount of flavor because the flavor is going to go bad and so on. So you end up with correlations between features, but not sort of uh, uncomplicated correlations of, you know, this feature is directly correlated to your outcome. You end up with correlations where, you know, several features in a complicated way are correlated to, to your final outcome. Um, so this is this is an issue that, that we need to address in, in this case, because, you know, going out and asking the scientists to generate another thousand, you know, samples and do all their controls is, is simply not, not feasible to do. So the way that, that you go about this in, in our domain is to try to inject chemistry into the model through, through feature engineering, right? So what this means is instead of just letting the model know, hey, I've got all these ingredients and these are their concentrations, if you think like a chemist would, would think here, you know, chemists think about things as the classification of the ingredient. Is it, you know, a polyol? Is it a flavor? Is it a gum? Is it an inorganic salt? Um, so you can start to build in um, extra feature attributes that, that are more descriptive than just the text of the ingredient itself, which really doesn't tell the model anything. And you can go pretty complicated here from just basic categoricals to numerical data, you know, what's the acidity of each ingredient and what's the density and, and so on. Um, so the second thing, the second approach that you can take to this, which I think is, is interesting, is trying to chain together, you know, first principles models with a machine learning model. So the idea is, you know, we have this first principles approach, this fully deterministic approach that knows how everything interacts uh, with everything else. Um, so you kind of push things through that model first and come up with an auxiliary set of features, which is what does the first principles model think? Um, and then you feed those in, into the model in addition to all of the other feature attributes that it has. Um, and that ends up actually giving you a huge improvement on both the accuracy and then also much more sensible feature importances. So just by way of, of demonstration, moving from left to right, you know, the left is a fully deterministic system. In this case, trying to predict the pH, the acidity of, of a formula, um, you know, calculate it. The middle is just a naive machine learning approach. And, and all the way on the right is 
you know, using the, these derived features that are coming from a first principles calculation in combination with, with machine learning across, across everything else. Um, so I should also point out that, you know, moving from left to right, we're not just shoving more features into the model. Actually, the number of features is, is going down um, because we're doing some feature engineering as, as this is moving across. Um, and so this isn't, you know, just the, you know, von Neumann's case of give me four parameters and I'll fit an elephant, give me five parameters and I'll make him wiggle his, his trunk. This is actually injecting more knowledge into the model itself. Um, so how do we scale this? So, you know, one issue with the approach that I laid out is it requires a lot of subject matter export, expert input, right? A chemist needs to look at the, the features. They have to look at the Shapley values and then decide, you know, does this look right to, to me, because they're ultimately, ultimately the ones who are the decision makers. So we have an internal process that we set up where, you know, a data scientist can train a naive model, put together the Shapley values that's inspected by uh, a scientist who can point out the flaws, make suggestions for different ways to do the feature engineering or different ways to include first principles model uh, modeling and redeploy it to test. The subject matter can look again and, you know, ultimately we end up deploying it to production. Um, so the last piece here, you know, which is really, which, which was really critical for us for deploying this at scale. So we have an internal um, application solution that, that we've deployed to the Colgate scientists around the world is making explainability part of the prediction, right? If you're a scientist or a decision maker internally, um, you need to make a decision about whether or not to use the model outputs or whether or not to actually make the product and generate all of the data. So in that sense, a global accuracy metric um, isn't, isn't that helpful, right? You need something that's gonna be specific to the prediction that you're actually giving. Uh, so there's two ways to do that. One is if you're using XGBoost, um, you put your prediction intervals on there to give people a sense of per prediction, um, you know, how well does this model perform? Uh, and then importantly, showing the Shapley values, the explanations alongside the prediction. So that way, you know, decision maker can look at this and if they don't think the Shapley values, you know, if it's a force plot for a specific prediction or the Shapley values for the overall model, it doesn't make sense to them, right? They have the power to, to veto it or to ask a question about the model um, before they actually make the decision. So this is really, a, a, you know, about transparency rather than trust uh, with, the, with the modeling approach. So, so to close on sort of the question that I, you know, first brought up about this idea of first principles or, or machine learning, you know, does this model accurately capture nature's processes? Does it capture chemistry, you know, in a broad sense? The answer is no, it, it doesn't, right? The, the model does not know chemistry. The models do not know chemistry. Um, but if you only consider, you know, the very small set of space just inside a toothpaste tube or just inside uh, a bottle of soft soap, hand soap. Um, in that case, it's, it's, it's quite good. And, th and that's good enough for, for what we're trying to do. So with that, I want to thank everyone for, for your time today. And I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have. Oh, thank you so much, Cleve. That was an awesome talk. So uh, we have time for a couple of questions. If we're not having time for all the questions here. Um, so uh, one question we got is, um, how do you account for things uh, so different as like shelf stability, which may be related to chemistry as well as marketability of a product, you know, like selling the product, which is not really directly chemistry related, or is that something another group kind of handles? Yeah, and so, so we do, you know, we are also trying to approach the question of marketability and what do consumers actually want, um, but that's a totally different question using different data sources. So data sources in that case are what are trends? What are things people talking about on social media? What are the types of reviews people are leaving? What products are being launched elsewhere in the world? Where it comes together is, you know, we ultimately have to find the intersection between the types of benefits or products that people want, and then the types of things that can actually be formulated into a reasonable product. And so that's where you can kind of have these two models play against each other. One model is trying to figure out, you know, what will make money? What do people want? And the other model is trying to figure out the feasibility of putting together a list of ingredients that will deliver on that. So they do come together, but they start off as separate models. Okay, last question. Um, so with the supply chain uh, stuff going on, uh, has it affected your ingredient list and like what you actually could put in toothpaste based on, or you know, whatever you're doing based on ingredients? 
Yeah, it's a huge use case. So big use case for this is trying to understand if we have an existing product um, and and for one reason or another, we need to swap out an ingredient or change the concentration because costs have changed or availability isn't there. Um, we don't have time to go back and do years of new product development. And so modeling is a very straightforward way to, to try to figure out how can we make those changes based on supply chain needs to get a product out quickly to, to respond to whatever, you know, the, the dynamics are on the supply chain side. So that's a huge commercial uh, use case of, of this.